Hello, everybody. My name is Yang from Northwestern, and thank you all for spending some time this morning to uh, hear about our research. So today, I'd like to talk about some research uh, we are doing on the replication problem in science. Uh, this is a work uh, collaborated with uh, Yoyo Wu and Brian Wuzi. And so Yoyo uh, currently is in China, so she cannot make it, and Brian is teaching. So I will deliver our work uh, on behalf of the whole team. So maybe everybody in this room are very familiar with the replication problem in science. So I will just uh, briefly uh, uh, introduce this. So actually, the real interest in this problem uh, started back in 2015 uh, with the RPP study, which was led by uh, Professor Brian Nosek. And what they did is they got they got about 100 papers from top psychology journals, and which is presumed to have the best research and research that's most likely to replicate. And then what they did is they uh, did uh, many replications of those uh, studies. And to everyone's surprise, more papers uh, failed to replicate than they replicate. And over 60% of the papers uh, failed to replicate. And this is not just in uh, psychology. Uh, similar results were also found in other disciplines, such as economics. So this has caused a whole lot of problem uh, that many of you are very familiar with. So this can, uh, has made people worry about the overall quality of science. And uh, this, of course, reduced the uh, funding levels. And can, it can also make science politically vulnerable, and a lot of other uh, negative effects on science. Besides that, quantitatively, it's also a very uh, expensive problem. Draper and colleagues estimate that uh, the cost of non-replicated knowledge is about 30 billion in one year. So if you think about that, over the next 10 years, it's about uh, $300 billion in a year, uh, sorry, in total. And if you go back 20 years, we're already at about $600 billion. So this is a very expensive problem. Additionally, people presume that work in the literature is a truth. And therefore, they don't identify those uh, non-replicated papers once they're published. So let me share with you that information. So what we did here is we went back to all of those 100 papers. And what we did is uh, we looked to see how these papers diffused through the whole literature. And ideally, uh, we want to see the replicate papers, non-replicate papers, uh, diffuse different. However, it is not. And so here, what we're looking at is a year paper is published going out uh, nine years. The blues are papers that replicate, and the red are the papers that don't replicate. What we can see here is the replicate papers and non-replicate papers were cited similarly over time. So people are oblivious of the fact that one is replicating, one is not. And if we look at the second degree citation, we see the same pattern. So all of those papers are embedding themselves into the whole scientific literature. So this is a really big problem, and people know it's a big problem. So currently, there are several approaches. One is the review metrics. So let me introduce the basics of what the uh, review metrics are. So we all know about uh, p-value, effect size, sample size, p-curve. These are things that we, uh, uh, we look to and we try to use it to uh, evaluate papers. But if you look at the correlation with the replication, so they are not very big numbers. And if you only go by these uh, metrics, they are not very predictive whether a paper is going to replicate or not. So another way people do is they have a prediction market. And in the prediction market, uh, people have, uh, so we, uh, they have a bunch of papers and they will bet on whether a paper is going to replicate or not in future when it's submitted to the manual tests. 
And the closing price of each paper uh, gives you a sense of the probability of replication. Of course, the prediction market does better than that. Well, but there are also some drawbacks. So first, uh, the prediction market is very uh, expensive. And second, it's also not very scalable. And it also takes a long time for people to find out the final results. So what we are going to do is we are going to uh, uh, develop a new crowd, uh, approach that is like a cost effective and allows us to scale over much larger numbers of papers with the hope of helping people do better research. So here is our approach. So we're going to use the machine learning algorithm that helps us uh, do the predictions. And then what, what we are looking at are uh, the uh, narrative, the review metrics, and the combination of the two so that we have some comparisons here. And why we are looking at the tax in, independent of, of all of those other things, because it may contain uh, has uh, some, some information uh, that other people have hypothesized about. And how do we know uh, our model works well? So what we are going to do is uh, we will compare it to the current state. And for example, uh, is it better than the review metrics? And, or is it better than the uh, prediction market? So let me tell you what we have found. We find that our model, based on the narrative only, is significantly better than chance. And it's also uh, better than just uh, the review metrics. And when we combine them together, I'm going to show you that our model is also equally as predictive as what's the best thing we have out there today, the very expensive uh, prediction market. And in our study, we used the nine data sets. The training data is called the RPP data, which has 96 papers from uh, two disciplines, social psychology and cognitive psychology. We have the narrative and the review metrics associated with these 96 papers. And then we also conducted out-sample testing. And in the out-sample test, we take the model that's calibrated on the training data set and use its parameters to predict data that the model has never seen before. If our parameters are correct, it should predict with high accuracy whether this paper will replicate or not. And so in total, we used eight outer sample testing sets from both psychology and economics. We know 96 uh, may be not a big number. Uh, given the methods we're using. So, but we know uh, these 96 papers share some common jargon, which we feel uh, can alleviate the problem of the small sample size. Additionally, we have eight out sample testing sets, which has very high diversity. They are coming from psychology, economics, social psychology, cognitive psychology. They do something like a regression analysis or lab experiment or statistical modeling. So if our model can generalize across all of those things, then it can also help us to alleviate the problem of small sample size. So in total, our out sample testing sets come from 330 studies uh, from 80 journals. And this is our research design. So first, we converted papers to the pure text. And where we remove all the figures and the numbers. And then we look at the narrative sentence by sentence. For example, the word experiment here co-occurred with several other words, such as reported, confirmed, and general. And after enumeration of all of those sentences, we have the all word pair uh, co-occurrence matrix. It looks like this. So for example, here in this matrix, the cell here indicates how many times the word reported and confirmed co-occur across all the papers. So we want to take the information in this matrix and reduce it to a smaller set of dimension, which has similar information. That's what the Wartovac neural network does. Besides the reduction of dimension, it can also allow us to represent a world uh, in a quantitative way. So what we do is we reduce it to 200 dimensions. And these 200 dimensions times the word frequency in each paper 
allows us to describe our paper's linguistic content. It looks like this. And okay, up to this point, the Wotuvac characterize uh, the linguistic content of the paper. And it provides us a numerical representation of a paper that will be used in our final prediction. And our final prediction is done by a classical machine learning algorithm called ensemble learning, which will make makes use of all of those numerical representation of the papers to predict the one zero outcome. So now we will take these 96 papers and each one will be characterized by its linguistic content and then we tag each as to whether it is replicated or not so that we can see whether there's a pattern between the uh, linguistic content and the replication. To do that last step, as I mentioned, uh, we use the machine learning. We do it uh, in a statistical way uh, that we run the machine learning algorithm get, to get one prediction. And what we do is we run it again to get another prediction, then another prediction. So finally, we have a distribution of predictions. When we do that, we use something called a cross validation so that we don't overfit. Here is an example of how the cross validation works. So x axis indicates each of the 96 papers, y axis. Uh, quantifies the prediction score given by the machine, and we run 100 rounds of cross validations. And the gray dots indicate the prediction score uh, given by the machine uh, for each paper across 100 rounds. And the red dot here indicates the prediction score of all paper in a single round. And then what we do is we compare these uh, prediction scores and to the ground truth. And we cal calculate the area on the curve score. The reason we use that is we want to connect the continuous prediction score and the binary outcome. So let me show you uh, what the machine told us. So this figure here uh, is the area on the curve uh, plot based on 96 times 100 runs uh, observations from the previous slide. X-axis is a false positive rate. Y-axis is a true positive rate. The dot line here indicates a random predictor or chance, which has an AUC of 0.5. Obviously, our, our method is better than that. Additionally, the gray area here indicates 95% confidence interval of the 100 rounds of cross validation. So this shows that our model is significantly better than chance. Well. There are many ways to evaluate uh, uh, the accuracy of the model. And uh, we already know our method is better than chance. So if we convert the information in this plot uh, to the distribution of AUC scores, it looks like this. The blue shaded area indicates the uh, distribution of our model's AUC score. So we can see it is centered at the point about 0.72. How to interpret that? Okay, it is saying that uh, if, um, if the machine learning algorithm is given uh, two, two papers without knowing which is replicated, which is not, then in 72% of the time, the machine is correct about that pair. Okay, in contrast, the random predictor has an AUC score of 0.5, which is equivalent to a random guess. But even if it's better than chance, uh, we don't know whether it's better than their uh, existing methods. So let's figure out how to uh, put together uh, something people use frequently, the, the review, review metrics and the narrative together. So when we, when we do that, we will rerun the entire algorithm we just run on the narrative, but on the review metrics only. And what we can see here is the red Shaded area indicates the performance or the AUC distribution of the review metrics. We can see our method based on the narrative is better than the review metrics. Obviously, they are also uh, picking up on uh, some different information. So what if we put them together? So when we put them together, what we get a better AUC. So it means that actually we can see it's a, uh, the, the combined model is significantly better than the others, so it's also got more information than either of the others or not. 
So we also conducted the outsample testing. So as we mentioned, we will take the model that's calibrated on the 96 papers, try to predict all of these papers, whether it is replicated or not. So when we put them together, what we get are high and consistent uh, AOC scores. We can see, so like the, the top set is about 0.74, the next is 0.76, and following by 0.66 and 0.68, they are some good AOC scores. So, well, we know that uh, the machine can do pretty well on its own. But does it better than the very best uh, human system, which is a prediction market? Uh, so let's put our model to that test. So for all of those uh, uh, studies was just to show you, so there are about 100 papers which have the prediction markets uh, information. What we are going to do is we will uh, do a horse race between the uh, prediction market and the machine. How can we, can we represent this? So um, how can we know like which method is doing better than the other one? Uh, because for in the prediction market, there's, there's only one score for each paper. So now we cannot show you the distribution. So the way we need to do is like we, we need to uh, uh, show you the comparison in a different way. So one way for us to do this is like uh, we'll take the information uh, in the prediction market that help us rank the uh, likelihood of replication for each paper. And then we plot it against the ground truth. So let's do it first for the uh, prediction market. So the x-axis here indicates the ranking based on the uh, prediction market score. And the blue are the papers that replicate, and the red are the papers that don't replicate. And of course here, this is a result of the prediction market. So the square indicates the prediction market. Later I will show you the our model. So basically what we can see is like the prediction market are, uh, are pretty much uh, correct. For example, if we look at this area, the highly ranked uh, papers are pretty much passing the replication. While on, on this side, the low ranked papers uh, fail to pass. So if we do the same thing for the uh, AI model, what we can see is something like this. So it has some, uh, some comparable performance uh, with the prediction market. So how to quantitatively uh, uh, evaluate this? So we introduce something called a top K uh, analysis. So it's a, it's a very practical way to uh, evaluate uh, or compare two methods. The idea is among these 100 papers, there are about uh, 47 papers that can be replicated. So then we just calculate the precision uh, among the top 47 for each method. Then what we get here is, so for the prediction market, uh, the precision is about 74. Uh, our model got like a 71. So think about this, like a prediction market may take months to, for you to find out the final results, it will cost money, but the model can be run within like a one, one hour. And so it will reduce some uh, labor intensive work for the human beings. So it's, it's pretty like, a, it's worthwhile to do that. Okay. All right, up to this point, I have just discussed, we create a model based on the narrative, which is better than chance, which is better than the, uh, just the review metrics. And when we combine them together, uh, we get something which has similar uh, performance than the very uh, expensive link, pre uh, sorry, the prediction markets. So, but there's an outstanding problem. Well, it works well, uh, but why? So let's explore some mechanisms. So what are some potential mechanisms? So one might ask, uh, is it because of disciplines? Or is it because of journal formats? Or is it because of the uh, topics? We found that actually none of this matters. We know it's not the discipline because when we do the sample testing, if you remember, we, we show that our model trend on the psychology papers can predict well. Uh, on the economics papers. And we know it's not journal format because we're looking at a study from about 80 journals. And we know it's not topics um, because our study covers a very diverse set of topics. Another thing might be, 
it might be the language that people use. For example, uh, in computer science, people may uh, frequently use something called uh, remarkable. Or some other people prefer to use the word significant a lot. Uh, a lot. So what we're going to do is we will uh, get the distribution of all words for the replicate papers and non-replicate papers. We are going to look at, uh, look to see uh, whether each, uh, the distribution of each word uh, is different for these two categories. Turns out it's not that either. And then the last thing uh, is we want to, uh, so it's not a single word we already found out. So the last thing we do, do, uh, we do is like we, we want to look if it's a combination of words. This is very important because human beings had a very hard time following the complex combination of words. So for example, for me, I might be keep, uh, capable of uh, keeping track of it uh, when I see the single word remarkable. But you know, what if it's not a single word? It's a combination like a much better than or uh, uh, significant better than. So it becomes very hard for me to keep track of all of those combinations. So for us to do this, uh, what, what we're gonna do is we, we will start to exploring the combination by using something called n-gram. So n-gram is, uh, is a set of consecutive words in a sentence. So let me give you an example. So here for the top sentence, uh, experiment reported is a two-gram. Reported confirmed general is a three-gram and reported confirmed general pattern is a four gram. So what we do is we compare the real text to a null model, and then we calculate uh, this score for each n gram term, uh, indicating how frequently it is compared to the chance. And then take this information of all n grams, the z scores, we can quantify a, a, a papers how atypical it is compared to other papers. And then we compare uh, whether the replicate papers and non-replicate papers have different distribution of uh, these metrics. And we found that actually they are different. They are different in terms when we use uh, two gram information or three gram information or up to five gram information, it's consistent. So it means that uh, these two categories of paper have some difference in the frequency of using this uh, combination of words. So we think this may be explaining uh, what's going on uh, in the machine learning algorithm. So to summarize, uh, we have several takeaways. So we know that uh, the AI model is picking up on some information that human otherwise don't incorporate. And we created the model based on the narrative, uh, which is better than chance and better than the uh, review metrics uh, even though that's uh, what humans works now. And when we combine them together, we get something comparable to the uh, best human system, which is very interesting because um, the prediction market uh, was supposed to represent crowd wisdom, which has been shown in other contexts that like, it should be the best uh, prediction that human can make. And so given all of those observations, we can see uh, our method can at least be used to prioritize the things that need to be looked at in the literature and do some self-assessment at least. So our next step, uh, first of course, we will want to further our study uh, or understanding about uh, what's going on uh, in the machine learning algorithm. And we want to find some final answer about that mechanisms. And additionally, we also want to further the human-machine interactions. So at least like uh, in the whole process, we will conduct some uh, uh, lab experiment to understanding uh, like a human and machine can both uh, learn from each other. And human can understand like uh, uh, what's the basics uh, the machine rely on to make the judgment. And also human can learn from the machine that like uh, how to remove the human's uh, blind spots. And additionally, uh, we plan to include more information, such as the uh, graphical information, which may lead us to a better predictor, which can help people uh, to do such a, uh, to solve this problem. 
So that's all. Thank you. Uh, I will take a question from Mark. I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative to start right now. Uh, just so I can be clear, yeah. you have an algorithm that mines the text of the data, yes. correct? And there are combinations of words in the text of a manuscript mm -hmm. that predicts the reproducibility mm -hmm. of that finding. Yes. So the words that we use are not like sample size and statistical results. They're completely up to us. Goodhart's law, suggests that any metric that becomes a target ceases to be a good measure. So now that I know that there is a secret combination of words <laughs> I can put in my paper that's going to make your algorithm think that my work is more replicable, will that create problems in the future for how we write papers? Uh, OK, so that's, uh, let's go back to the final uh, interpretability problem, actually. OK. so. Uh, to this point, uh, what I can say is uh, we just, uh, this is a very preliminary result about what's going on there. So I can only say uh, this is something machines are reading on the uh, subconsciousness of people. But if you try to intentionally uh, do this uh, embedding or backing, maybe it will disturb the results because we have observed uh, many examples in the machine learning, how to tweak uh, small pixels in an image which will make the algorithm fail. So that's, um, that's a little bit beyond the, <laughs> the, the master uh, perspective. That's about the human. So that's why I say uh, like a human machine, the competition or collaboration, the core is on the human side, like how to make good use of, uh, of, of the machine learning algorithm. So that's all I can say for now. Very interesting okay. talk. Paul Glazew, clinical epidemiologist from Australia. I just want to ask you, did you compare this with some statistical models that might predict it? Um, there was an allusion to one which would be just the sample size, which we learned on Thursday, would predict the replicability. A larger sample size is more likely to be mm -hmm. um, uh, replicable than a smaller sample size. Or you could do something more sophisticated using a Bayesian method, for example, with an informative mm -hmm. prior yes. and a Bayes factor based on yes. the strength of the evidence in the in the first study. Yeah, we thought uh, about these uh, issues, and so that's why when we develop the uh, algorithm, we use something called the ensemble learning in computer science. So in computer science, how to solve the small sample size learning is like, okay, first uh, somebody suggests for for the master side. Uh, we use some ensemble learning, which is combine some simple uh, classical learning algorithm together and let them vote the final result. That can, to some extent, solve this problem. And again, another is uh, try to prevent the overfitting or something due to the small size. Uh, we try to use as more as possible for the our sample testing set because so I'm if, not referring. Yes. To, oh, sorry, I wasn't. Uh, you might be misinterpreting my. Yes, sorry. I think you're talking about the training set. I'm re referring to the sample size in the study itself as being a predictor of whether it's a, the, the replication replicates. Mm, okay, you mean you talk about the cross validation uh, part? Is if, if you've got a series of 100 studies, if some of them are small and some of them are, are large, the larger ones are more likely to replicate is what we heard on Thursday, which I would accept. So that would be okay. a predictor then of whether it's going to replicate small ones unlikely to large studies are much more likely to replicate uh, as an unsophisticated way. There are more sophisticated ways using Bayesian methods that yeah, would help Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, you know what? Actually, uh, within the algorithm, we are uh, one of the uh, uh, ensemble learning algorithm we are using is Bayesian. So uh, we also check some very simple method like uh, uh, logistic regression or mm -hmm. decision tree uh, individually, um, it has uh, a little bit uh, less uh, or uh, worse performance than that, but it's very consistent. And also we also try, when we remove the uh, water vac part, I mean, which is complex, if we only uh, use a bag of words, which is a very simple representation of uh, a text, 
which has a very comparable performance uh, with what we have uh, provided here. But thank you for the question. We will make sure we do all of those checkings. Yep. Hello, so yes. Titi Pat from University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. So basically, uh, I have uh, two small questions. So the first one, uh, I would like to ask, what did you do after you get uh, the list of like word vectors and which kind of like model you use? And then the second one is that uh, you say that the uh, ingrams for both uh, like replicable and non-replicable are different. Why don't you just use like ingram ingram as a feature to uh, just like, yes. to predict? Very good question. So uh, let me ask. Uh, let me answer the first one. So first one, uh, you are talking about the feature engineering, I believe. So right. Yeah. So uh, after we get the Wotvac representation of each word, and uh, we do as I show you in the slide, the very simple sum product of the word frequency in the paper and the word fact information. And uh, what we do actually, uh, the actual thing we do is like we uh, split the study into the results and discussion section. So in, we separately uh, uh, quanti quantify them. And then we also cross-check the uh, consistency. So there are many other like feature uh, uh, engineering stuff where we don't have time to present here, but basically it looks like this. And uh, a second question is very good. So actually now we try to uh, uh, develop a sensible way to incorporate this uh, ngram stuff we are using. Uh, but, uh, but the first thing we need to know is that we, we need to find a much, much larger uh, sample size of the paper writing. So currently we use this, uh, uh, have correct, uh, collected about uh, five or 600 of them. So we, compare, we use it as a baseline or null model to compare how each engram, how it is uh, frequently, uh, the frequency is overrepresented or not. So, yeah, but more accurate way is like we need a much uh, comparison uh, null model. Yeah, to get a more accurate mm -hmm. representation. And uh, to answer that, actually, I have tried to use, only use the n-gram frequency uh, or n-gram vector. It can provide us, us some uh, prediction power. Yeah. At, at least better Because probably there, there will be like a, an n-gram of like all the field of psychology and then like those are non-replicable are like different from like the baseline psychology field, for example. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, it's possible. I, I need to look more uh, in this direction, actually. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. Uri Mao's uh, Brain Institute, Chapman University. Um, nice to meet you. Hi. Trying to understand some things about your method. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, the claim to fame, I guess, is that you're doing roughly as well as the prediction market. If I understand correctly, the way you worked on the prediction market is that it was done on that set of 96 uh, papers uh, that you started with. Did you try uh, out of sample predictions on that as well and compare that to a prediction market on that? Because otherwise oh, you can be happy oh, no. with your own uh, results. Oh, sorry, uh, actually, I, maybe I mispresent something. So actually, uh, what I have shown you, uh, why I say there's no distribution. Okay, for the prediction market, for each paper, there's only one score. And actually, for uh, the AI model, there's only, also only one score for each paper because it's uh, out-of-sample testing. So we cannot see all of those uh, papers which have the prediction markets before the machine gave the judgment. No, but then you've got the procedure where you compare it to the prediction market and you make various assumptions there. And those assumptions could be unconsciously helping you in getting uh, your 71% compared to that 74%. Did you try the same method with all those two Try to use that on papers that you have not, uh, you know, try to do that on economics data set or something like that where you have not. Uh, among those uh, 100 papers, there are uh, economics papers, which does not belong to the uh, original 100. The, yes, there are some uh, economics papers, yes. Oh, I'll, I'll take it offline. I, I, Thank we'll you. talk about that later, maybe. Sorry. Hi. Uh, yes. Thanks for that. Uh, Olavo Manal from Federal University of Rio, Brazil. We actually have a systematic replication in biomedical sciences. We'd be happy to give you data to train the model in a year or two. But for now, uh, have you, I mean, the, the model has pretty much been trained on, on, on the, social, the, the expanded social sciences, like economics, psychology, 
uh, social mm -hmm. psychology, etc. Yes. Uh, have you tried? Uh, but language is very discipline specific. Sometimes, I mean, have you tried anything else? I mean, I, I know that we don't really have very big replication initiatives in the life sciences, but you have maybe like Canada Gene Association versus GWAS or the drug gene interaction uh, mm -hmm. James Evan was talking about yesterday. I mean, you do have like databases you can use for that. So, have you tried anything beyond the social sciences to see whether the model holds? Uh, good question. So. Actually, we have another stream of project which is looking at the uh, finance uh, reports, which is uh, like uh, uh, related with uh, uh, this problem. So in a finance report, so people will uh, sometimes uh, some corporate corporate's performance is uh, beyond the expectation, some is below. So we try to uh, use the same uh, methodology to look at the uh, the language people use there, and whether there's some similar patterns we can observe here. And uh, thank you for uh, bringing up the uh, medical science. So actually, we are also now collecting the text content of those uh, papers, because we know in the medic medicine side, they are also doing the replication studies. So we try to get that data and try to further our understanding uh, on this problem in another discipline. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yes. I am Boris Ritzman. I'm from uh, Chen Zuckerberg Meta. Two questions. Oh, uh, two questions. Yes. First, um, did you do uh, when you did engrams? Did you do ablation study? Did you do you know which engrams are mo most closely predictive uh, and associated with this? And my second question is: uh, You wrote a paper about this. Did you try to run? Uh, your paper through the pipeline, <laughs> and did you get the replicability uh, score for it? Yeah, uh, as John said, like uh, uh, if we don't manipulate this, uh, if we put that in inside the algorithm, I don't. I did not try that, but I will try the later, because uh, uh, the language is changing, uh, keep on changing, <laughs> because we do the modification a lot of, lot of times. Uh, but we'll be happy to do that. Uh, at least it can tell you how confident uh, uh, you are about your own uh, studies. And go back to your first question. So indeed, we try to look at uh, which engram are uh, the factors uh, or the contributing factors. But actually, it's very hard to, to do that. Well, here's the reason. OK, so in, in a paper, there'll be like a two gram, maybe 10,000 pairs. And then three gram will be exponentially. And then finally, how we uh, represent a paper's uh, atypicalness is like we look at the distribution of all the engrams inside the paper. We take the median or take the bottom 10% to represent how, uh, as a, some representative points, to indicate uh, how atypical this paper is. So it's, it becomes a, a very summary uh, matrix. So it's like a maybe not because only one or three uh, engrams terms which are very uh, unusual to make the whole paper become atypical. It's a, it's a, a lot, much larger setup. So it's hard to say which one is a key reason. But uh, at least this, there are some hope or there are some technology which uh, may help us to do that. But that was not yet uh, developed up to uh, apply on engram. Some maybe I, I forget to mention. There's a technology called NIME uh, in the computer science side. It's a very good uh, uh, algorithm automated uh, program to let you understand which words uh, are contributing to the machine's judgment. Uh, that's why we we say that the single word does not uh, make uh, make the difference in our uh, algorithm because we use a NIME to try to understand it, but actually there's no consistent pattern we observe there. So, uh, But of course, if we can expand or extend the nine method to the higher dimension space, maybe it can help us to understand which engram or which set of engram are the reasons. Thank you. Charles Twarty from uh, Jacobs Corporation. And more relevantly, I'm Sorry. running one of those expensive prediction markets right now. <laughs> Uh, the replication markets project were uh, funded by DARPA, and you may beat us, but you may not beat us with word to vec. That <laughs> yes. uh, would be entirely too humiliating to the humans. Uh, if we can somehow agree to have a drag race 
uh, you're on. And the question is, the fact that prediction markets are still slightly edging out, doesn't that suggest that humans are, in fact, doing better than word to vec at pairwise and longer n-gram constructions mm -hmm. of words? OK, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, prediction, uh, sorry, the prediction market, uh, in my opinion, represents a crowd waste. Uh, the theory behind that is like uh, uh, the judgment uh, should be independent. So that's why um, the drawback of the prediction market is like uh, if people are not embedded with each other, they may, may, there are, there, there's possible some bias inside. And that's why if we go back to the citation uh, plot I show you at the very beginning or even after the uh, replication results are posted out, people keep citing uh, those papers because actually they are not independent of each other. So uh, maybe that's, uh, that's bias. Why it does not work? Like the based on the citation, it cannot be dis distinguished from each other. And uh, second is like, I definitely the prediction market is the best. I, I want to acknowledge that. But wh what we do is we, we try something else. We try to, when we try to combine the prediction market score and the, the score given by the machine, Actually, we can get much better performance than uh, either of the others alone. So you can achieve like a, a 0 0.5, uh, 0, sorry, 0 0.85 accuracy. So which is a very good uh, result. So it means that even though the prediction market is the best uh, to this point, but machine still has some uh, unique information which human can learn from and improve uh, the final results. So that's my current answer to this question. Normally, Thank you. Hi, Elise Hi. Gould from the University of Melbourne. Um, I have a question about your methods for um, how you combined the, um, the model trained on reviewer metrics with the model trained on like the text-based models. Yes. And is that a method you plan to use to um, combine um, the predictions from the, the prediction market with your machine learning model? Yes, uh, in a fair way, we should keep the uh, underlying learning algorithm to be exactly the same to show that uh, they are playing a fair platform. Yes, I want to say that. Yes, definitely. Is, does that answer? Uh, sort of. I, what was your method for combining the two models? Oh, it will be very simple uh, feature engineering, just combine them together as a known vector. Uh, we try several ways, but we report the most uh, robust and stable uh, uh, method uh, performance. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Steve Goodman from Stanford. I'm going to ask actually the first question, just using different words from Paul Glasgow. First of all, why are you interested? in predicting replication. And it doesn't mean that the first one wasn't true. In fact, you could have a significant and a non-significant study that would represent more evidence than a replica to replicated study. So I don't understand what the value is in predicting the replication. And also, the, the second, as though it's not true, uh, particularly, anyway. And the second is, you can write down an equation for the probability of replication. This is basically what Paul was saying which has to do with the probability that various differences are plausible, then times the design characteristics of the two studies, the type 1, type 2 error. So all you have to do is know the, uh, the, uh, the, the size or, or the design characteristics of the second study to know whether it's going to replicate. So I would expect you to have a predictor of, is there anything in the text that correlates with prior probability? And is there anything that words that correlate with the design characteristics. And you've stripped out all that quantitative information from your predictor. You're, you're, you're looking for words that sort of predict those things. Why not actually try to predict those parts of the literal mathematical equation that would predict replicability? Uh, very good question. So uh, go back to why we look at the replication problem. So uh, as I stated in the very beginning, so uh, we know currently existing uh, methods uh, besides the uh, uh, review process, which is known. Uh, even prediction market is very known. 
So our uh, reasoning underlying this is like, uh, we try to create a, a method or tool which can help you uh, to get some self-assessment, like uh, self-checking bef before you like uh, submit out or give to your peers uh, to do the review. So it can make the everything efficient because uh, if, if, if you don't, you are not aware of some, uh, like a, something you are not very confi confident with, then if it go out, then it will create some problems. But if you can do some self-checking at the very beginning, uh, maybe we'll, you, you will remove some uh, errors or save some money or even save some time. And second, it's like, as I told you, um, when I compare the prediction market and the, the, the machine learning algorithm, I say that the one big advantage of this method is like it's, uh, it's not labor uh, intensive. So we try to save some time and of course some money uh, to, uh, to solve this problem and help people. So, and uh, sorry, I forget the second part. I'm no, sorry. That, that's Could okay. But the equation it, it can be can be implemented in a few minutes too. So that that doesn't take yes, a long time. Yes, uh, true. But uh, if you were try to write an equation about replicability, you need a very strong uh, theory behind it, like what to include there, what's their relationship, right? And but that will need a lot of work to verify. Uh, whether this equation is uh, generalizable across all of those contexts. So actually, this, that's a very good direction, I, I want to say. But we try to uh, go an easier direction to uh, rely on the machine's uh, computational power and their uh, ability to handle the complexity on, uh, in this kind of interrelation, uh, complex interrelationships to, uh, to solve this problem. But of course, it, what you said is a very good uh, direction, and I, I will be happy to incorporate in our future uh, research and compare it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes.